Well, now on Radio 4, with Halloween only days away, it's time to lock the doors and light candles as we make an appointment with fear at Rhys Shearsmith's Haunted House. Thank you. This is Rhys Shearsmith, welcoming you to my haunted house. In this two-part series, we'll be exploring an assortment of horror themes. And where better to broadcast from but in the wonderful surroundings of this reputedly haunted building, uh, Sutton House here in Hackney. Originally known as Brick Place, Sutton House was built in 1535 by Sir Ralph Sadlier and is the oldest residential building in Hackney. A phantom woman is said to haunt this 500-year-old Tudor house. And there have also been reports of a wailing hound and disembodied voices emanating from the empty rooms. And with me to discuss these various subjects and hopefully keep the spirits at bay are three horror enthusiasts, all of them wise and entertaining in their own ways. They are my League of Gentlemen colleague, actor and very dear friend, Mr Mark Gatiss, comedian and light entertainer, Vic Reeves, and the broadcaster and screen queen herself, Yvette Fielding. Please join me in giving them all a very warm welcome. <laughs> Today's theme is an appointment with fear. We're exploring horror on the radio, television, stage work, and in literature. And during the programme, we're going to discover the impact of some of this work and the effect it's had on our, some of our guests. But uh, let's start by listening to a bit of a Tom and Jerry cartoon. <laughs> Once again, the phantom is abroad. Trapped in the lonely tower, the girl can hear its mocking laughter echo louder up the vaulted staircase. <laughs> That was a clip from an episode called Ferady Cat, where Tom is listening to a horror story being read on the wireless. And I picked it because so I thought it's, it's the old woman's voice is so engaging and really scary. And it kind of, it's indicative of the cosy atmosphere that you kind of get when you listen to horror on the radio. I think it absolutely epitomizes that feeling of listening to a good scary tale, even though it's in a cartoon. Is that the same voice as the sort of the queen in uh, The Wicked Witch in Sleeping Beauty? Or? Sounds like it, it is, doesn't it? it? Mm. Yeah, it, it sounds same. like um, Norman Bates's mum, actually, that's why. My <laughs> wife does that voice, actually, with, with the children at night. <laughs> I play the music behind. It sounds very much like that at bedtime in our house. <laughs> well, let's talk about um, what it is, the recipe for uh, a good scary tale. Mark, you've had many goosebumps over the years. I think it's a very personal thing, isn't it? That's the, that's yeah. the thing. It, it varies. You can never legislate against sort of scary things for children because they'll find something. You could ban every vampire and werewolf and they'd be frightened of the curtains. You know, it's, when I was a kid, I was terrified of wolves, having never, ever seen one ever. Even in a film, it was the notion of them. You yeah. Know, they they scared the life out of me. So, for me personally, it's much more, it's always about, uh, it's about the slow build-up of dread. I think, and then a kind of good payoff. It's all about the sound. It's, right. uh, you can have a scary voice, but you've got to have a sound to back it up. Or if it's a deadly silent room and you hear something, that's the scariest thing ever. Yeah. I completely agree. I think you can watch some movies and you can hear the music, you know, working to a crescendo and you think, oh, it's going to happen now. They're going to get stabbed in the face or something absolutely horrendous or their face is going to get eaten alive. Or you can have a completely silent part of the movie and then something boom happens that's what makes you jump i think for me and frightens me more than anything is that is the silence actually is the yeah. silence and then something happening yeah. what do you think vic is would be a, a definition of horror for you i think scary is kind of attached to being excited the earliest time i remember being terrified and having nightmares as a child was my dad let me stay up to watch the hunchback of notre dame with charles law right and he was so hideously disfigured that I couldn't sleep. I, 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 well, Your dad. Dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> when I was little, I woke up in the middle of the night and the entire window of my bedroom was filled with a massive face of a, a, like a gypsy Rosalie-type classic old woman. Wow. 
big earrings, I don't have forgotten it, really loads of curly hair. It was I've Tina Turner. Up, and I'm looking at <laughs> It was Tina Turner, yes. I don't know what it was, but it was really frightening. And I thought, this is, this is what it is to see a ghost. This is not a dream, this is one. really happening. <laughs> exactly that, yeah. A lot of people have experiences, really terrifying, terrifying experiences, either just as they're going to sleep or as they're falling to sleep. And they're yeah. hypnagogic and hypnopompic sleep states. And you are more than likely to experience where you think someone's sat on the end of your bed, someone's uh, mm. leaning over you, you hear your own voice being whispered, you see things, and you'll have your eyes open. It's just your brain, I think it's your right temporal lobe, is actually being so oh you know working over the top that yeah. you're you actually think that you are really really seeing these things your eyes are open you think you're awake but it's actually you're not you're dreaming these things every morning i wake up and there's this horrifying voice in my ear <laughs> and it's sarah montague on the today program <laughs> <laughs> but i can just i can just make her go like that so i'll tell you something that this is perfectly true i i used to live in a squat in in New Cross in 1983, right. and I was talking. I spent all night talking to this girl, who lived in. She lived upstairs. She, she lived at the top of the floor, and she said she saw this figure at the end of her bed, who said, "Don't worry, everything's going to be all right." And we were talking about, it and I said, "So what do you think she meant?" And she said, "I don't know." And then two days later, she was killed. She was knocked down by a bus. <laughs> what, what's all that about? <laughs> Was, things were not all he right. Meant, no, he meant heaven. <laughs> heaven <Cool>. was good. <laughs> well, that's what it was. Obviously, you're coming, you're coming to us. Don't worry about it's it. All right. yeah. I'd rather have had to look out for a bus in two days. <laughs> <laughs> Back in what many regard as the golden age of radio, the BBC uh, produced one of its most famous horror series called Appointment with Fear. Starting in 1943, the programmes were introduced by Valentine Dial, an old Harrovian actor who narrated the scary stories as the man in black. Uh, the series ran for several years, and The Man in Black was reprised by Edward de Souza in the 80s for Fear on 4. Here is quite a rare clip performed for television in 1966. Appointment with Fear. This is your storyteller, The Man in Black. Returning after many years with a new series of tales in our intimate little program, Appointment with Fear. Tales to soothe you, amuse you and send you happily to bed. Do you believe in the devil? Now stop talking nonsense. Uh, the devil could put his mark on your face. Uh, oh, yes, he could. If I bargained with him. Did you ever know that an ancestor of mine was burned as a witch in Spain? Stop it, I tell you. You're hysterical. I offer my life. I offer my soul. If this man can never face a cavalry again, and this I swear, by the reverse class of Satan. Peter, come back. Nika. Terrifying. <laughs> I'm the man in black now. Are you? I rang my dad and said, Dad, they've asked me to be the man in black. I was so excited. It's only the third one ever. And I went down to do it, and part of the classless society we now apparently live in, they wanted me to do it in my own voice. And I, would, I was so prepared. I, did, I went out the night before and got bladdered so i'd sound like valentine dial and he was going no no do it in your own voice so if anyone thinks i'm just not bothering it's just because they're not right, when, when is it on i need to know this? Right, hey. listen. what sweet rest there must be in the grave <laughs> that's what i tried to do <laughs> let's say your man in black what sweet rest that must be <laughs> In the modern world we live in. <laughs> Griselda Harvey, uh, we're going to have a look at a clip now. She was the one that was in that clip with Roger Delgado. She became known at the time for having one of the most terrifying screams. <laughs> she sounds more upset. I know. <laughs> Vic, do you think women today are still good at faking what, it? What? <laughs> I, I hear that scream every morning <laughs> when my wife opens her eyes and sees that she's married. We all laughed at that when she did that. Do you think it's a requirement anymore of horror to have a good oh, do you have scream? A scream like that? I, think it's, yeah. it, I think it's very tricky to have a good scream. Yeah, a I real scream. 
You have. have you? Oh, Is it yeah. high pitched? It's quite a good one. It's quite a loud one. Would you care to um, offer it up? Well, it depends. Well, you see, under pressure though, like yeah. that. Well, you can't be as good as Griselda. You see, do I cover my face at the end and do all that? <laughs> well, that well, then do it. You've, you've we'll do it. done that. You've built it up. Here he is, everybody. Oh, God. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, I always wished I could scream like that. And what we used to do on old Reeves and Mortimer shows was I used to sort of, like, concoct a place in the script where I could scream, and we used to get a girl like you to scream <laughs> so I could just mime to it. Because <laughs> I've always wanted to scream like that, but I, I just, you know, I sound like Captain Beefheart. When <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let's um, once again open the vaults of the BBC archive and examine some more early um, contributions from... The world of horror. Firstly, this is a clip of Algernon Blackwood, a novelist and short story writer who inhabited the world of fantasy, which is pervaded by the supernatural. Blackwood's stories started life on the radio in the 1930s. He's followed by a compilation of extracts of the 1950s radio series, Do You Believe in Ghosts?, where members of the public volunteered in their hundreds to tell their own true life eerie experiences. We all stood staring, shivering. The horses ceased their whinnying. For a moment, nothing happened. Only the quiet stars looked down. Then Smith turned slowly round, lifting his eyes towards those quiet stars, as though he saw or heard something. Hear that, he whispered in a strangled voice. Hear that, it's coming closer. That's what I've been hearing now, on and off, two nights and days. Listen. When he got very close, he came very quickly up towards me, and I thought, he's drunk. And I braced myself for the impact. But as he touched me, he went right through me. I was quite frankly a little scared by now because I couldn't imagine anybody being there in the center of that wood for any uh, reasonable purpose at all. Then there was a shout from behind me in my left ear. What do you mean by coming to my house? How dare you come into my house? Creepy, disembodied voices. He was just a burglar. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll go back to those stories, but Algernon Blackwood, do you think you can appreciate why that kind of storytelling was popular? The thing about ghost stories, which, which works so brilliantly, M.R. James particularly, is the idea of the past intruding into the, into the present or, or e even into antiquity from even further back. Yeah. And that, that's always a fantastically scary thing, the idea of something very old lurking under the surface. Ever since I was a kid, I've always had a local ghost story book beside my bed. Right. I've got one now. I've got lo the, the local ghost stories of Kent. Right. Which I, I, don't, I rarely look at. Yes. <laughs> but I, but when I was a kid, I remember I had this, the local ghost stories of County Durham, which you'll probably know. Yeah, I wrote one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there was one which I used to love, and I was a probably, uh, you know, about 15, 14 or 15, and it was this local person. She was quite rich, and she had a very big wedding ring, which is worth a lot of money. You can probably guess what happens. Her ring finger was chopped off. She died, and the finger kept crawling around County Durham. <laughs> <laughs> it took it ages. <laughs> Trying to find its owner. And that was it, a ghostly finger was seen crawling along. As far as I remember, that's what happened. You need to stamp on it. But, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, that, that scared me, and I was always on the lookout for that finger. <laughs> the last, last I heard it was around, um... Newton Acres. Around Newton Acres. Yeah, some, <laughs> stuff, some industrial estate in Newton Acres. Are you my owner? <laughs> Did it surprise you about that there's, there was in the 50s this programme, Do You Leave in Ghosts, where people yeah, were talking about their yeah. experiences? I'm always intrigued, and what makes things really frightening for me is when you get real-life accounts. You know, they're doctors, physicians, they're, you know, scientists, and they're, they're telling you stories where things have really, really happened in their homes, and they're terrified, they've seen things, and that, to me, is very, very frightening. One of the more recent offerings that really uh, affected me, and I think Mark as well, was this six-part serialization that they did a few years ago of, uh, of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, which is a brilliant um, adaptation for the radio. The story centers on the Creed family who move into a pleasant community, but after a short time into the, in their move, their son is killed, Gage is killed, it's horrible. And grief-stricken, the father finds out that there's this cemetery that you can bury your pets in, but they 
they come back to life. And uh, unfortunately, when he decides to bring his son back to life, he unleashes far more than he bargained for. As I left the airport, I knew for the first time with absolute certainty that I was going to go through with it. I was going to resurrect my son. Back in my motel room, I watched eight half-hour comedy shows back-to-back until 11 o'clock. And I got off the bed and went out to do... What I guess I'd been fated to do from that very first moment. Had such a great effect on us both, Mark. It's such a. It's, it's for the story it's, itself, it's isn't it? The name it, Gage. Yeah. <laughs> the name um, Gage. It's, it's a brilliant. It was brilliant. Though. I remember just happening upon it one night, and it, it's ever so disturbing. It's a brilliant story, anyway. But there's something very brilliant about the way it's produced. But I, I heard it, and I found it very disturbing. And then, I went on a holiday on my own just after we finished the first series of the league to Spain, and I thought, oh, I have a nice get away from everything. And I got to this place in the middle of nowhere, realised it was a huge mistake. Didn't speak the language. This, this little villa in the middle of nowhere. And it was really... It was, I got there at night and I went to bed. I thought, the World Service will cheer me up. <laughs> I put it on. And it was a pet cemetery. I went, no! <laughs> it's like, this is following me around. It's coming on again. That's one of the reasons I find it so frightening, because I think I'm haunted by that radio My pet cemetery. <laughs> Explain the end to me, because I don't... I, I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't read it, read it, but I've heard that... His, he, his wife gets killed by his son, and so he resurrects his wife and then waits for her to come home. Yeah, yeah. But then why would you wait for her to come home if you know that she's going to be, like, evil knife-wielding... Oh, oh, well, I think by then woman. he's just... Gone. He's got into it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to keep with something that frightened you again, uh, Yvette, and listen to a little audio extract. You won't believe this. The waves were like great walls of grey-green. They dashed over the rocks that lay all around the island, and spray flew from them, gleaming white in the stormy sky. They rolled up to the island and dashed themselves against it with such terrific force that Julian could feel the wall beneath his feet tremble with the shock. The boy looked out to sea, marvelling at the really great sight he saw, For half a moment, he wondered if the sea might come right over the island itself. Then he knew that couldn't happen, for it would have happened before. He stared at the great waves coming in. There was something else out on the sea, by the rocks, beside the waves. Something dark, something big, something that seemed to lurch out of the waves and settle down again. What could it be? What was it? (laughs) It was a ship. Ah, it was It was a ship. I was seven years old and my mum had gone and bought me one of those sort of audio book tapes. In fact, no, it was a reel-to-reel, the first one we ever got. Oh, well. And um, I listened to that in bed. And uh, the, the one that I had was sort of had this sort of the, 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 the um, orchestra playing this sort of wild music and you could hear the sea crashing and something was coming out of the water. And at seven years of age, I was absolutely terrified. I was shaking underneath my duvet at Eni Blyton, for God's sake. You know, but that started for me the whole kind of that roller coaster ride of fear, that kind of I really like and I what I listened to that night after night after night and I learned every single word of that of that particular audio book. I loved it and now my, my children have listened to it as well. But it's that bit where the ship comes out of the water, the way it's described and the way it's put was was really quite frightening to a seven year old kid. Yeah, well I think that's that what you t- say, Mark, about how the oddest of things will stay with you and frighten yeah. you as a, as yeah, a child. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the most popular horror stories that made a successful transition from book to stage uh, and screen is, of course, Susan Hill's Woman in Black. Here's a clip, so embrace yourselves. Well, she had one mourner anyway. I saw no one. <laughs> well, she was inside the church and then waiting outside. I thought she looked unwell, but... She's there now. Perhaps somebody ought to go and have a word with her. No. No. Go away! Quick! Get away from here! Mr. Petrel, what's wrong? We shouldn't shouldn't watch like that. Let's not be alive. It's morbid curiosity. You're right. I, I, I have a mind to speak to the school teacher. Look, you frightened that poor woman away. She's gone. 
I have to show that every Christmas to friends, family and children. <laughs> Until <laughs> ten years ago, I stopped doing it about ten years ago, when, when they all died. It's the so scariest good. thing, yeah. the scariest thing ever on television. And it was just the fact that you just get a glimpse of her in the background. Yeah. And, oh, man, that was, that was scary. Yeah. And, the, and, those, and the, in the mist, when the noises of the, the horse coming up yeah. the causeway. Yeah, on the causeway, the sound yeah. again. I mean, just the sound of the rooks in the graveyard, just that. Yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I went to see the actual theatre. Yeah, I was going to say, what was your experience of the live version of it? The li yeah, I went to the West End and I went to see... It, it was just th these two guys, the sound effects, fantastic set, and... Everybody in that audience was just rigid with fear. It was just so frightening. And even, I won't spoil it, but even at the end, people were too frightened to get up from their seats to leave the theatre. And you do, you do think to yourself, how can a theatre production make people rigid with fear? I saw really Starlight is. Express and felt very much the same. <laughs> <laughs> rigid with fear. I do like better, didn't I? But it's that, one, you know, that's, that's, that's something I always get, I get quite shirty about when people are trying to stop it. They think that children particularly don't want to be scared. They so do, they're so bloodthirsty. It's all, it's genuinely so healthy. You come out of that theatre and you feel it's a cathartic experience. It's fantastic. You feel on top of the world. You, you're laughing and, and having a great time because you've had a thrill. Yeah. It's not, nothing bad about it, you know, wonderful. Apart from all the memories, yeah, which stay with you. <laughs> oh, and she put us. You say that that night when you're up at three in the morning with your child. Yeah. Like <laughs> I am every night. <laughs> a famous bard once wrote, "There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy." Maybe the BBC had this in mind when they, in 1992, presented Ghost Watch, a wonderful postmodern ghost story, which has uh, come to be known as. A kind of hoax akin to Orson Welles' famous War of the Worlds broadcast in 1938. It was a wonderfully produced documentary with all the trappings and the tropes of a live broadcast. Ghost Watch used a familiar cast of television presenters. And it begins like this knockabout investigation into the most haunted house in Britain. And however, before long, things start to go a bit wrong. <laughs> Suzanne, are you okay? It's all right, love. Oh, don't get upset, love. Your mum's here. Oh, dear oh, God. God. Oh, it's illusion. What do you want us to do? So, sorry. What should we do? Sorry, you're all right. Oh. Get, get away, get no, away from... No, Mum, they have to stay. They have to see everything. Uh, Sarah, uh, it, it's all right. Don't worry. It, it's some kind of allergenic psychosomatic reaction. Could be self-mutilation. She could have done it with her own fingernails, you know. They're saying she used her own fingernails for this. Fingernails? What flaming fingernails? <laughs> Look, what do you want to do? Sarah, what? don't worry. I I've seen it before. It will subside. Feel her temperature. She's burning oh, up. Don't touch me. It's like a meat locker in here. It's so cold. But we can't move because she's in agony and she won't even let me touch her. What do you want me to do? Well, yeah. Get a flannel and get some water. Yeah. Come on. We'll get out of here. Come on. I should tell you to join to see the next program. That in fact, we're staying with what we have here from Fox Hill Drive because the events are, are so remarkable and dramatic that we'll be staying with them for as long as, as we have to. So who remembers that when it went out? Does anyone have any memories of it? Parky, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant actor in it. <laughs> it was so it was real. Fantastic. It was the thing that made, it, it made you question whether it was real or not. The genius of that, I think, it's, very, it's kind of uneven. There's, there's some brilliant things in it, but the, the absolute copper-bottom genius is that the ghost is called Pipes. <laughs> yes. Is it? Pipes. It's yeah. so brilliant. And it's because he lives in the... They think it comes from the cupboard under the stairs. And then it makes a banging sound. I think the he's in the radiator. Like, oh, that's a real ghost but name. But there was a huge controversy yeah, about yeah. that program. Massive. Yeah. I've right. never heard of it. Did you, not, did you not see it when it went out? Never, no. I didn't see it when it went out. I've never heard of it. Oh, it's good. Have you seen it now? Have all the stuff you've seen? I've heard of uh, Parky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's not real. No. Well, ten years on from <laughs> Ghost Watch, um, the reality television launched this programme, Most Haunted, for Living TV. It was presented by Yvette Fielding in a series based on investigating paranormal activity. In this clip we're about to hear and see, the team visits the now-closed West Virginia State Penitentiary. It has a gruesome past and it's reported that some of the most violent inmates have hung around to terrorise anyone that dare enter, but they dare. If there's anybody here, if there is any spirit people here now, any astral beings, any spirit people, men, murderers, killers, something's crying. Something's crying. 
crying. If there's anybody here. <laughs> Please talk to us, not twice, if you can hear my voice. What was that? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. How many spirits are here now watching us? Oh, what a... <laughs> what a roller coaster. I mean, how... What should we make of... Um, of most haunted. I mean, is it a legitimate, proper investigation? I mean, I presume it, it is. On the one hand, it is, but is it? How far is it en entertainment and a thrill to watch off and come, fun? Put it off. Come, put it down as entertainment, which, right. which I, can, you know, I can understand because you know people watch it and you start giggling and you start laughing because you know it is quite funny because you go and get how many spirits are you know murderers, killers, come forward, slash my face, you know that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so it it is, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Do it again, please. <laughs> you've got that entertainment side of it and the mm. comedy side of it, but then I think you kind of grip the audience because they're kind of, oh, gosh, you know, what's going to happen next? And when there is something unusual that we manage to capture, people are intrigued by it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Ofcom say it's entertainment, and it isn't. It's a legitimate investigation. We do go in there. We do spend the night there. We do set up our cameras, and um, we do investigate paranormal activity. What, what's the closest thing you think you've ever seen to something? We're actually recording more and more voices, more strange noises that si we've sent the, the audio uh, footage away to scientists and universities and they cannot come up with a logical explanation and yet still science refuses to, to oh there's such things as ghosts, there's, there's more to life than this, there's still sort of I get really kind of, a, you know emotional yeah, about it because I get it. really kind of cross. And you went on it, didn't you? What was I your experience? It, yeah, was was it... a, I've always been a big fan since the start yeah. and it is like being on a ghost train. When you're in a ghost train, you want to be scared. So you're looking for it, a knock or anything that, you know, the show that I was on, I don't think anything, I don't know if anything... There was really nothing happened. major that... that no, I don't happened. think you, you did. You saw something. I think I was just getting into, into the vibe of it all. My warmest thanks to all three of my guests today. Happy Halloween. Sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. Thank you and welcome back to my haunted house. In the second part of this two part series, I'll be exploring another assortment of horror themes as we sit here in the Wenlock Barn at Sutton House here in Hackney. Several spirits are said to haunt this building, including a lady in blue, a lady in white, and a wailing dog. And with me to discuss the extracts is the man in black, Mark Gatiss, the man in white, Vic Reeves, and the wailing hound that is the actor Mike Roberts. <laughs> Today's theme is films, fangs, and frightening fellas. Before I introduce the first clip, Mark, let me ask you why is it, do you think, that we enjoy going to the movies to be scared? Is it the adrenaline rush? Just to get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> For you. <laughs> it's a roller coaster thing, isn't it? It's a healthy scare. I think it's, it's a complete flip side of having a good laugh, and it's a very similar thing. They often talk about the, the same muscles are involved with screaming, as in smiling. And uh, I think it's a wonderful, thrilling thing. And you, if you, especially if you're in a big audience in a cinema and you have that kind of big shock. The most terrifying moment of me going to the cinema to see a scary film, well-known character in Lewisham at the time was a man with a molten face <laughs> and he used to wander around the streets. <laughs> did you name him that? Well, he, he did. He had this sort of, like, you know, the elephant man, but his face, had, like, if, you'd, if, if he was made of plastic and he'd been attacked with a blow lamp. But anyway, so I went to the pictures to see the thing with my friend and the man with the molten face was sitting behind. <laughs> so in the break, between the films, he tapped us on the shoulder and lurched forward and went... <laughs> which was more frightening than the, than the thing or anything. <laughs> so a trip to the cinema can be very scary. Yeah. But when you go to the cinema, you're kind of watching people, you know, and experiencing something. You kind of know what's gonna, what they're going to go through and you, your own fear system kicks in and you, you, you go along with the, the experience with them. I'm afraid as a kid, I went to see every horror film going, but 
I lived in Tottenham, so there were about 20 flea pits between there and Dalston. And I was usually the only person, <laughs> you know, going straight from school to see these films. So I, I didn't actually share Curse of the Undead with anybody else. <laughs> you were all sat by yourself. Yeah. Like the man with the molten face. Yeah. I didn't, yeah. I didn't get acne, I got mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look at um, a few uh, clips now. And um, we start in 1963 with an unforgettable journey to Hill House for the haunting. <laughs> My name's Marque, Dr. Marque, a scientist interested in the supernatural, the unnatural, if you like. I came to Hill House to find the key to another world. Stop it! God. God. Whose hand was I holding? Why is that film so unsettling? Uh, it's the scariest film ever. It is really funny, isn't it? Film noir with the emphasis on the noir. <laughs> and it's, but I'll tell you what is really scary about that film, when I saw that and, and when I see it now, is the, the sound effect, the boom, boom, boom. When there's that, the are in bed and there's the banging on the, the grate above the door. Yeah. <laughs> like a cannibal. Oh, man. That is scary. I saw it when I was about eight, I think, with my dad and my sister. And I remember the thing I think was, I was most terrified of was that my dad was terrified. And I can still see his, his hands kind of gripping the, the arms. Yeah, just yeah. terrified. We were all like pouring the sweat. It's so incredibly... Um, and there's that scene like where the two girls are in the bedroom and they're, they hold each other's hands and yeah. then the lights go on and they're not holding each yeah, other's yeah. hands. They're holding someone else's yeah. hands. So whose hand was I holding? Uh, oh. It's, it's pure intellectual fear. It, it's one of those very few films that seems to completely bypass your consciousness and it goes way back into the subconscious, way back into some, something very primitive. Mm. Back in the 70s, there was probably the very first all-night movie show. It was at the National Film Theatre. It was on Halloween and they showed films all night. Mm. And they had this horror night and they, it was free bat's blood in between the films, which obviously <laughs> was tomato soup, you know. And it was great. And the audience were very, very want to show how cool they were. So they were kind of laughing even through films like Dead of Night and um, the Christopher Lee Dracula. And then The Haunting started, and it got quieter and quieter and quieter. And that moment came where you get that big close-up of whose hand was I holding? And I've never experienced this before since in the cinema. The whole audience went... <gasps> that was it. But it was an intake of breath from about 300 people. It was the strangest sound. And it was like the equivalent of your dad gripping mm -hmm. the side of the chair. It, everybody, and it wasn't a conscious thing, was it? It was, it was getting to a place where you can't consciously go, oh, that's scary, or that's not scary. This goes somewhere else. And very few films, I think, have ever done that. And it's one of the great that, tributes. Yeah. Do you remember, uh, if you've ever read the book, that there's, a, there's a bit when Eleanor, Julie, um, Harris plays is uh, driving to the house because it's a new life. She's getting away from her horrible family and her invalid mother who's just died. It's a, a new start and she's imagined this wonderful place she's going to go to and then she just stops the car and the, the line just says the house was vile it stops you yeah. dead yeah. reading it just goes, oh. I, I, the, the, the sound on that was incredible it's it's better than any sound i've ever heard on any horror film and i was thinking about the music and you quite often get Shostakovich played in horror films du, 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 like the ninth but there's Penderecki, who did his symphonies for Auschwitz and Hiroshima, and Jacob's Ladder, which was used in The Shining, and that that music, which is atonal and discordant at the same time, was kind of the benchmark for horror films. And then you've got um, Mike Oldfield, who never thought when he was doing <laughs> Jupiter Bells that it'd be <laughs> used as scary music. Absolutely. Yeah. And well, got, then, is, then I've got you, you've got um, Karl Orff and uh, <laughs> Carmena Burana, which yeah. is about a, a Spanish prostitute and is always used in all manner of horror films, including The X Factor, <laughs> as, a, as a display of horror. Modern, <laughs> modern horror. Modern horror. Yeah. Uh, well, that links us into uh, The Exorcist, and a decade later, William Friedkin directed this 
story about possession. The film broke new barriers with its gruesome special effects. Something beyond comprehension was happening to a little girl. A man had been called in to try and save her. The, the X Factor. Yes. It was <laughs> Simon Cowell. <laughs> it was, of course, The Exorcist. Let's have a clip. Well, then, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Damien Carras. And I'm the devil. Now, kindly undo these straps. If you're the devil, why not make the straps disappear? That's much too vulgar a display of power, Carras. Where's Reagan? In here with us. Horrible. Properly scary. Do you remember Mike going to see it then? Back in the 70s, <clears throat> the studios would drip publicity for months often. And with The Exorcist, there was all this stuff coming from America about how people had been possessed while watching it and <laughs> the set had burnt down because of it and all terrible things. And I remember going to see it with a teacher friend at the ABC South Woodford. No wonder I was scared. And um, <laughs> it was absolutely jam-packed, because this was on the Sunday. It was jam-packed. And again, as the lights went down, people were scared. They were scared before the film even started. Yeah. It was a very interesting experience. Plus, I think what, what survives, it's not the head-turning and stuff like that, which does date, I think, and it's odd that that's what people f were fixated on. What it has, is, I think, brilliantly, is an atmosphere of absolute, genuine evil. And there's a fantastic bit when uh, Father Keras, who's lost his faith, the Catholic priest, is on the subway and this tramp goes, Spell Rodolphe for an old quiet boy, Father. I was a Catholic. And he just stares at him because he doesn't have anything left to give spiritually. And then later, much later, much later, one of the voices that comes out of the possessed girl is this tramp's voice. Spell Rodolphe for an old quiet boy, Father. And he just goes, I just scared the life out of me. Because yeah. it's genuinely about despair, which is the most frightening thing of all, I think. Yeah. Wonderful. Anyway, let's turn our attention to another film uh, released that same year, which uses a storyline about a child in a totally different way. It's based on a short story by Daphne du Maurier, and it's directed by Nicholas Rogue. Don't look now. most disturbing films for me. I mean, do you think Don't Look Now is so scary because it's set in, in the real world? Well, that was the first X film I ever went to see. I went to see that when I was 14. Oh, that terrified me. And did you, you know, you listen to, you see that opening sequence where his child dies in the pool. What is so chilling about that is there's no music. Yeah. It's just real. And then a bit of Shostakovich comes in. Yes, as you As, you <laughs> as per. But it's just so terrifying because it's so silent and real. I don't think you ever get over the, the moment. You just don't know. You think, is it a ghost? Is the little girl alive? Is there a, what is it? And the moment it turns and it is not that, you just go... But what Ugh. is she? She's a, there's a, there's a, in Venice, there's serial a killer, sort of yeah. serial killer. Yeah. Yeah. But is she the serial killer? Yeah. Yeah. Never really got that. Yeah, I think I was so. only 14. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite confused by... The fragmenting of time right, yeah. in Don't Look Now Then. And uh, Don't Look Now Then. <laughs> and I probably would still be. Don't confused. Look Now Then. <laughs> don't Look Now Then. <laughs> the Northern. Spent... Look later, the sequel. Yeah, the Northern. We, spent most... <laughs> we seem to spend most of our 20s doing. She's sitting between you. She's laughing. <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> Yeah, we did. That's all we did, we did wasn't it? Wrong <laughs> Psychologists, they've said that horror is the recreation of childhood fears and fantasies. A child alone in the dark, hearing a noise in an empty room, watching an episode of Rent a Ghost. <laughs> As adults, we know the answers. They have an effect on us, but they try to tap into our childhood and conscious fears. Vincent Price once said, It's a lot harder to scare the pants off us once they become longer. <laughs> What childhood fears of our panel have been unlocked in horror films? You know, I return increasingly, constantly, to the things that made me happy when I was eight. <laughs> uh, childhood obsessions and, and kind of yeah. the things that first got you either involved in cinema or books or whatever, and they're kind of incredibly powerful things. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was the first film I saw at the picture. Terrible. Finding and, film. And it's just, you know, that is a fantastic story about... 
Robert Helpman, who played the child catcher, who's a famous dancer. You did this extraordinary part, and a friend of his took his kids, and they were absolutely mortified, of course, by this spectral thing in the middle of this film. And he kept saying, it's only Uncle Bobby, it's only Uncle Bobby, and they, they, they wouldn't believe him. So he rang up Robert Helpman and said, can I bring the kids around and explain that they're terrified of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? He said, yeah, of course. So he drove them all the way out to Robert Helpman's house and he said, look, you see, it's only Uncle Bobby. And he went, what do you mean? <laughs> Lollipops, cherry pies, all free. He just did it all again. Brilliant. <laughs> what, a, what a monster. <laughs> well, um, talking childhood memories, uh, singing Ringing Tree had a great effect on you, didn't it, Mark? Let's see if it's as you remember it. Quick, take the back to the Magic Kingdom. Now she knew for certain just how much the dwarf had deceived her. It's a charming, beautiful Technicolor fairy tale, but it was so it was in a slot called Tales from Europe, as I remember. And being a kid, it seemed to be on forever every summer. It's actually an hour long. It frightened me because I saw that when I was at an age when we just sort of like got beyond mocking Jerry Anderson. It was like we loved Jerry Anderson, then we Got a bit older, started to mock it, but that was beyond everything because it came from East Germany and it was frightening because it was wrong. Yeah. It was all rotten. Everything about it was done badly and sinister. And it was, that's why it was frightening because it wasn't from our world. We, were, we understood Jerry Anderson and all that stuff, but we didn't understand that stuff. That was really... <laughs> Badly disorientating. No. It is. I mean, it's by accident, but it's the yeah. fact that it was dubbed and you could hear, you know, the dwarf said, then. <laughs> 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 the first kept, but the what thing that used to scare me the most was that fish that came out. Yeah. And the bear, had, the blue fire. Dead eyes and spoke. <laughs> with, without any really, sort of, no consolation or anything. It was, it was <laughs> no fearful. Consolation. Where I lived and where Mark lived, near where Mark lived, mm. was a place called Hell's Kettles. Yeah, yeah. Two great big bottomless pools which had that fish. Right. <laughs> <in the swimming. laughs> that it lived in there. <laughs> and apparently if you went swimming in Hell's Kettles, there's a good chance that you would have been devoured by that fish. <laughs> you were told, you know, from being a kid that that's where... There was that, that terrifying monster was down there. The Kraken was down Everything was down there. <laughs> the whole lot, all of them. <laughs> Mike, you should remember, you'd be old enough to remember the next clip we have from the Quatermass experiment. What is it? It's a sort of powder, but it's heavy. And I'd say colloidal. Organic. Is there any more of it? Yes. I tested different points. That starts everywhere, lining the wall behind the gridding. Centrifugal force might have... Spread it out between. Well, from here. A lot of it? Yeah. What went on here? What did it do to them? What's amazing is that that version, you can still get it on DVD, and it, technically it still stands up much better, I think, better than the film, film does. Yes. Because you've got six beautifully honed episodes, each one ending with a terrible scare that just did the back of, you know, did your brain in. Cause... What was the one where the monks, there was monks walking through the tube station? I think that was a Duran Duran video. <laughs> there was one, I remember watching it on our old black and white echo television. Uh -huh. And I must have been about eight. There was in the tube station, some monks started walking through the wall for weeks afterwards. I was dreaming about I think you've been to Hell's Kettles that day. <laughs> what do you think it is about like the mixture of science fiction and horror? Why that works so well? I think it's a good example of the future and, let's say, the naive is the fly. The future, he's got a time machine or a time transportation machine that sends you back. But that I remember seeing, you know, that when... Help me, help me. Help me, help me. Help me, help me. That little fly at the end. It is hysterically funny, though, that bit, I find. It was... i tell you what, when we went to school after, every, you know, we'd seen that... Watching I'm talking about the first version, that people, you know, kids at school going, help me, help me, but they were all terrified whilst they were watching it. That was done as a terrible special effect afterwards. Mm. But they had on the soundtrack, you know, they had it ready for this little voice going, help me, help me. And they're on... They're, they're, Vincent Price is having a really good discussion with Herbert Marshall, and then they have to react to this. Help me, help me. And they just started to corpse, and they couldn't do it. And if you watch the film, they're not looking at each other at all at that point, because they couldn't get through a take <laughs> anymore. You, they just 
Couldn't do it. I told you it was hysterically funny. I was right. <laughs> now, we're going to briefly look and get our teeth into the impact of Draclia, as he's known. Dracula. He's had many incarnations on the silver screen, with a rather chilling start with Nosferatu in 1922. Then, of course, there was the sequel, Nosferatu 3. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and a splendid portrayal by Christopher Lee in some of the better offerings. Let's have a little uh, montage of Draclia. Mr. Harker, I'm glad that you've arrived safely. Count Dracula. I am Dracula, and I welcome you to my house. Brilliant. It just chills me that his introduction is so formal and is yeah. so noble. But it's so rare. It was a very unusual thing. People were very used to Bela Lugosi and the kind of Hungarian... And that's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and Christopher Lee is just a, a very sexy man. He just comes sweeping down the stairs. It's like a huge impact and a totally different take on it. You know? Yeah. Do you think that's why he's one of the more enduring popular Draculas. Well, it's also, you, you, not very long after that, he bursts into the study and his whole mouth is just gory with blood. He's got his and eyes. he's just a, a total beast, you know, and I think that the, the sort of contrast between the two things is what makes it so powerful. Dracula is just a sexy playboy <laughs> who creeps up with big teeth, come into my bedroom. <laughs> with this not scary, is it? For me, Nosferatu is the frightening one. Because of what happened to the film, the original film, in terms of it being made without permission yeah. for a copyright from Bram Stoker's widow, and the film then was ordered to be destroyed. There was every print. So the copies that we have now are just copies of copies of copies of copies, but in a strange way it works for the film because it looks like some kind of really weird documentary. Yeah. It's all, a lot of it shot on location. And the scenes with the boat coming into the harbour and all the rats mm. running along and everything, it's quite disturbing. But over the last two episodes, we've discussed much that is great about British horror, but um, we couldn't have a series about horror without at least trying to pay a few tributes to the frightening fellas from Hollywood, like Sir Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, Peter Lowry and Vincent Price. They opened up so many new avenues of, of, of terror in what was a golden age of horror on the silver screen. But it's rare uh, that you see them being funny. There's a few, we've got a few clips here of them playing up their reputation as horror's leading men. Uh, Mr. Lugosi, I'm Fred Allen. I guess my face looks familiar, doesn't it? Yes, you look like something that fell out of a closet the night I was on Inner Sanctum. <laughs> Of course, have you met the fellows in my band? Yes, Spike, I've seen them. And there's one question I want to ask you. What's that? Are you trying to put me out of business? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hope. Why do you call me Mr. Hope? I don't like to get too familiar with my victims. You know, I go to see these movies every once in a while, and I usually go into a little movie theater somewhere love to sit behind a couple of teenage girls. And in America, they're always eating the popcorn, you know, they're throwing it in there. And one day after The House of Wax, which was a very famous one that I did, after it was over, I just leaned forward to the girls and I said, did you like it? <laughs> yeah, so you've got um, a great affinity for these characters, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, because I just grew up with loving the films and my dad was really into movies, so he got, got me into them as well. And I, I, they're, they're just such wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, in fact, I don't, don't know if you know this, but uh, where we are sitting at the moment, if this program had been recorded in 1949, and it sounds like it was, <laughs> if it had been recorded then, you could have walked around the corner and gone to Hackney Empire because Peter Laurie was appearing there in Music Hall. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yes, he was reciting the Telltale Heart and then doing some gags. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but he was, um, he was a very interesting man and, of course, very educated. He was Brecht's favorite actor. Yeah. And uh, Brecht used to come around and complain to him that he wasn't doing the great theater he should be doing and then borrowing some money off him again. <laughs> but um, I guess of all of them, my... my my favourite probably was Vincent. I just used to, as soon as another Vincent Price film came out, you know, I'd be there. I'd, I didn't care what it was as long as he, as long as he was in it. And um, I think probably my favourite was Mask of the Red Death. Mm, I saw that right. four times in wow. one week. And Fall there's a, of the House of Russia. That's one. Do you know the great story about that? Roger Coleman decided he wanted to make a bigger budget movie, still costing tons, you know, and it was going to be in colour. So he goes to the producer, Sam Markov, and he says, 
I want to do the fall of the house of Usher. So he's going through the script. He's got a big cigar and he goes, what's this? Where's the monster? There's no monster. And Roger said, I can see my film going out the window. <laughs> he's, and I went, the house, the house is the monster. So they get, they get the go ahead. They're, they're filming it. And Vincent has this line, the house breathes, the house lives. He goes, Roger, why am I saying this? He goes, that line got me the movie. Fine, I'll make it work. Well, we're lightening the mood. Let's explore now a short montage of extracts uh, where comedy and horror have worked well together. Now, Mr. Potter, I want you to show me exactly where you and the young lady were. Through here. Slow bottom. Slow bottom, Sergeant. You stay here. What? All by myself, Sergeant? Yes, slow bottom, all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I think I might get up early and be in here in time for the first carols. And then I could put some sherry out for the bell ringers. That'd be nice. And, uh, you know, the kiddies from St. Mark's would be coming, so... Oh, thank the Lord. I was hoping to see you again. Hey, I'm sorry about the snow pour before. I was in a bit of a mood, but I I'm happy now. Hello, Dave. I'm sorry? Is that Dave? Oh, God! It's nice to see you again, Dave. All grown up. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Master Chef. Tonight we'll be meeting three of Britain's most innovative new chefs. And so without any further ado, let's go over now to the Red Kitchen and meet the first of our new chefs, Joan Baptiste. <laughs> Where on earth did you get that Master Chef sketch from? <laughs> what were the, the gestation of that? Well, I suppose it's <laughs> taken something that's really kind of nice and <laughs> unoffensive and then turning it sinister. It was just like, why don't we make him float and have a totally about <laughs> <laughs> Right, so yeah. These things, are, you know, really... In, in, it wasn't manufactured in that way. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was quite sinister. Yeah. And why do you think um, Karen Screaming works so well? I mean, we've got a shared memory of watching it, haven't we? It's mostly uh, Oddbod. Yeah. This and particularly pretty... Oddbod Jr., who is perhaps the most terrifying thing in all <laughs> creation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but Oddbod Jr., when he's created from the finger, and he has this... This, this sort of child mewling, noise, yeah. this mewling noise, it's horrible. It's yeah. a rare thing, it's genuinely frightening at times, as well as very funny. Mike, there were lots of American uh, shorts brought horror into their comedy, like Lauren and Hardy, Murder Case, and Abbott Costello and The Mummy, and Three Stooges meeting the Wolfman. But as a fan of Groucho and the Marx Brothers, they never did it. Why do you think they stayed clear of, they of, did, a, of they a horror did, crossover? They did one horror one in the radio series, the ah, right. Flywheel, that Groucho and Chico did. There's one line, actually, that should have been done by Groucho, which is the Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein. And Lou Costello doesn't usually come out with one-liners. He's not really that, it, you know, he's always acted upon. But in that, that one, of course, he's talking to Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman. And he, I'm just trying to imagine Groucho in it. And he goes, uh, you don't understand. Every night when the moon is full, I turn into a wolf. Yeah, you and three million other guys. <laughs> See, it's not better from Groucho. Right? <laughs> Brilliant. And of course, uh, we can't leave without mentioning our horror influences. Um, they've kind of peppered everything we've ever done, haven't they? Well, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Because we're, we're very serious about horror. Yeah. We love it, and about proper scares, but it's also it's the, always the flip side of it. We spent so many hours watching a brilliant, underrated film called Blood on Satan's Claw, Piers Haggard film. Very odd film. It's the only horror film set in 1689. And for that reason alone, it's bizarre. It's, it's, so, it's so particular, everything about it, but it's, so, it's wonderfully frightening. But we, you know, we watched it to death and then it becomes slightly absurd, which but that becomes also part of the enjoyment. In the way that the, the Wicker, sick to death at the Wicker Man, something that was once a really cherished thing to us. And now everyone. It's a bit yeah, spoiled. But it's, it's, spoiled. Um, it, it's very much two sides of the same coin, I think, always. And uh, people like uh, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, Vincent Price, and. Uh, to, to us, really, the, the, the Acme, which is probably Theatre of Blood, sort of ideal film to watch ever, because it's, it's so literate and witty, very funny, but properly nasty. 
and and it has you know fantastic things of killing off people in the manner of Shakespeare's plays. And um, well, sadly, it is time to close the coffin lid on this collection of clips and uh, close the door of my haunted house. And my warm thanks to my guests, Vic Reeves, uh, Mike Roberts, Mark Gatiss. We hope you've enjoyed this look back through just a few of the many vaults of horror. And until next time, this is Reese Smith saying, "Sleep tight." And don't let the bed bugs bite. Reese Shearsmith's Haunted House was produced in Manchester by Stephen Gardner.